would like to get involved with advocacy work and the work that I'm doing surrounding around education, there are um, two avenues that you can that I'm asking everybody to do. First and foremost, get involved in your community neighborhood school. Okay, get in, go to the community meetings at your neighborhood school. Go to the school meetings. Get involved on the school advisory councils. Make sure your voice is heard. There's a lot going on right now. We're fighting for our school board to come back into the Philadelphia control. Make sure your voice get heard in this fight. What do a elected school board look like to you? Do we want elected? Do we want a mayor appointed? Do we want to take the politics out of the politician's hands and have an elected school board? That's something that some people don't want to talk about. But one thing I, I realized, if we want change, we got to remove the power out of some of these uh, politicians and some of these people's hands so that way it can be fair to everybody. You know, I'm doing this work because of a lot of reasons. One, God had placed a purpose in my heart. Okay, I share a story. I was an at-risk teenager. I grew up in a home where my father was addicted to crack. At the age of 15, I dropped out of school. I was running these streets. I was getting suspended left and right in schools. I was the at-risk teenager that everybody that you scream at on these kids that say, you ain't nothing, you ain't going to be nothing, you're going to end up in jail, you're going to end up dead, you're going to end up in prison. I was one of them children that you screamed at. And unfortunately, it took a bad situation in my life to get a wake-up call, as I call it. You know, when God woke me up and realized that the life I live in wasn't right. And I tell people, since I gave God my life, I went from a high school dropout to a graduate with a master's degree. So don't tell me what God can't do. And this is what the purpose that he laid in my heart, to speak out for other at-risk children like me. Okay, because just but think of it this way. And we put more resources in schools to deal with the issues that our children is really facing and speaking about. We will have a change. If, you, if we have resources in school that got to me before I ended up in them streets, imagine if I'm doing this now, imagine what I would have been back there 10 more years with experience. So this is why I fight a whole lot. Um, Alicia wanted me to share about the parent conference and the award I received at the parent conference. The award I received at the con parent conference, one, it was unexpected. Okay, I do not, like I said, I don't get in this, I did not get in this work to be awarded. Because one thing I know in advocacy, advocacy is past, I call heart work. It's the work of the heart. It's not the work to looking for a big name or getting, it's not. It's because I see or I sit outside on my steps. I live right around here. I live right down the street from here. I live in the projects. I'm not ashamed of where I live at. I, and I, I pull out a chair on the nice days. I come outside my building and sit outside my building and just watch what's going on. And that's what I'm fighting for. Everybody on my block, my two boys, Everybody that struggled, everybody that been molested by their, a loved one like me, everybody that been hurt by somebody that you just knew would never hurt you and loved you, I'm fighting for you because I am you. And that's all I do this work. So there, I got the Conrad Award for um, my, the work of developing leadership and developing community partnership. And I was surprised about the award because it's something that I did not expect to get. Um, and in this work, you got to create community partners. In order for this work to get done, partnership is necessary. You have to learn how to work with others in order to get the job done. So the award was just a war for something that I, I believe in doing. I got to get the job done. You know, just like I'm working with the 22nd Police District right now. You know, with their first annual Women's Empowerment Conference. You know, this is just, we got to create partnerships. This is what is needed to get this community done. I'm not trying to take over the city. I'm not trying to take over the world. I'm just trying to make sure my little space here in North Philly, 10th Street, Thompson, Master, Gerard Avenue, Spring Garden, Poplar, all the schools around here, Spring Garden Elementary School, Dunbar, Kearney, we got Ben Franklin, so many schools around here. I'm fighting for these communities and that's what I'm doing. Dylan Armstrong and I am one of the plaintiffs on this Supreme Court case that is called William Penn versus the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. This lawsuit is to try to get funding fairly in the state of Pennsylvania. It's a group of parents from across the state, school districts, the William Penn School District, a lot of school districts, the NAACP of Pennsylvania chapter, and also the Rural Association of Pennsylvania. And we're 
were all suing the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania State for the reason that the funding that they held it, the mechanism that they use to fund our school districts is not fair. So what we're trying to sue is, and we got the first part of our lawsuit won, where we have the funding formula now in place. But what we're still fighting for is a fully funded formula, okay? We all know that a funding formula without money is a waste of our time. And that is what the Commonwealth is doing right now, is wasting our time and our money. What we're asking is the way the funding formula currently works is only new money that only new revenue that the state generate can go into this fund the formula. And we know right now that the state is broke. So any new revenue is no revenue really. Okay, what we're asking the Commonwealth and the Supreme Court to do is put all money through this fund the formula because it has been proven that this fund the formula that we have, which is a bipartisan formula, which was both the Democrats and the Republicans and the Independents in the House and the Senate agreed upon this formula. So since we all agreed upon this formula, we said this formula is fair to everybody, then here go the we're asking now put all the money in it. So on September the 13th, we had oral arguments on why the state Supreme Court should hear our case. Why do we? Why should I be able given the chance to testify? And what we're telling the Supreme Court is because I should get a chance to testify and tell the court my side because of the fact that how these illegal funding cuts and all this racial disparities is hurting me, my community, and the population that I represent in this lawsuit. I represent every low-income family in the city of Philadelphia. So that's you. Whoever you are, you're low-income. And people think low-income is like, oh, you're not receiving any money. Or No, I work a full-time job, okay? I, I, I do make $15,000 an hour, and I share this. But unfortunately, because I make $15,000 an hour, I don't get a lot of help. So I am struggling now. I don't get food stamps. I don't get any type of help anybody else get. So, and working a full-time job, taking care of money, I gross, gross coming home 700 After taxes, I come home with 500 And to take care of me and three people off of $500 a month every two weeks, which is 1000 a month, that is low income. So I want you to understand that I am not a welfare recipient. I was a welfare recipient. I ain't going to knock it because I need it. I used it a whole lot. Okay? But I want to get out this mindset that people have about low-income families. Low-income families, like we're uneduc un uneducated. I'm a low-income family, but I have a master's degree in business development. Okay, so we are educated out here. We are we are normal people out here just trying to make it by one step at a time. So when you think of low-income families, don't think of people on welfare or anything like that. Think of this single mother working hard to take care of these two kids every day. I go to work Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, just like everybody else. So don't think of low income as the welfare recipient. Low income, I am. That's why I am. And well, I didn't get a t chance to testify. All the Only the Supreme Court let the lawyers testify because that was the oral arguments. And what the Supreme Court allowed the lawyers to say is, why do we, why should we get a chance to testify and say our part? What is wrong with the system? The first part that's wrong with the system is that during oral arguments, the state pretty much said that the children have no rights. What? Do y'all hear what I said? The state said... The children of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania do not have any rights when it comes to education. Now, that first and foremost is wrong. We all know that children have rights, and everybody believes that. But when it comes to education funding, your children have no rights, okay? They don't have no say in anything. So it is the school district and the state and the Commonwealth tell us what to do. Now, come on, all y'all people out there fighting for gun control that I'm fighting against, <laughs> y'all gonna tell me our children ain't got no rights? Come on. This is why I talk about our Commonwealth being fair across the land, okay? That's what I want to see in public education. I want to see every place that I go to in this Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to have great schools. It should not be re regardless of where your zip code is, regardless of what your demographics is, regardless of what your race or economics level. Guess what? If I 
have a child in Erie, Pennsylvania should have the same resources as a child in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The child in Montgomery County should have the same resources as the children of Philadelphia County. The children in Armstrong County, because I've recently met people from Armstrong County, Pennsylvania, they should have the same type of resources as the families in Pittsburgh County, okay? This is what we're fighting for, that regardless of where you live at across this state, every school is great, and that is my slogan. Every school is great across this state. So that's what I want to see. I want to see all the resources the same. Public education in Pennsylvania should look the same across the state, regardless where you at. I, I'm proud of our great top schools, Masterman, and all these the Girls High Central, the top Hill Freeman, all these top schools. I am proud of y'all. But it should be like that everywhere. It shouldn't be just these five top-notch schools or these schools here. If it's all public education, then all public education should be the same, regardless what it is. And that's what I want to see in public education done. I, we're in the age of technology, but when I talk to my families that live in rural Pennsylvania, they don't even have the structure, the infrastructure to have computers. Right. Every school should have a computer lab. We're in the age of technology. There's no way around the world. Every school should have smart boards, okay? Every teacher needs to be, be trained to use the smart boards also, okay? There's no point in giving out the tools if we don't have teachers that know how to use the tools. And technology and the teaching is not together, okay? They do not go together. Some teachers are great with using technology in it. Other teachers are not. So what I would like to see on the education front, look at our teachers and our certification. Make sure that being that we're in the technology age, that they learn how to use technology in this age to supplement what our children is currently doing resources in, but unfortunately the people that have to use the resources don't even know how to use them. So this is what the type of training I want to see. I want to see our teachers that may not is too old to be in the classroom because it's a two. Uh, this is a new generation out here, all right. And we need our younger teachers. Well, I want to like to see a strong mentor program where we giving our new teachers that's coming out the resources, the how to dis escalate problems in the classroom because that is not in college, de-escalation, how to handle rowdy kids, how to deal with discipline, or some things I've realized that teachers are not trained because they are been trained to, they have been trained to their subject. If you got a math teacher, that's all she know is math. She don't know about de-escalating the classroom, conflict resolution, or anything like that. Yeah, they give her a section in the book to tell about it, but her purpose is learning math. All right, so this is what I mean by let's put in real resources that realistically help and make sure that the training realistically help the teachers and the students. Because conflict resolution skills, which I believe is a big part of why we got a lot of these issues going on in these streets that fall out from the school to the home to the streets, all this crime that's going on. Imagine if we start teaching our kids conflict resolution skills in the school. So this is why I'm a, I consider myself an education advocate, but I'm a family advocate because everything to me comes back to education. On the school district website, um, starting in November, we will be having Title I meetings and parent meetings, okay? I will be um, on a lot of these meetings. I will be the facilitator on. So check out the school district website start, site starting in November. I will be having parent meetings on everything you need to know about education. Our first meeting, you got to learn about the money. So our first meeting is going to be about Title I funding and how Title I funding affects you, your child, and your child's school, okay? So I would definitely want once you get involved starting in November, we're going to be starting our Title I meetings back up. Look on the parent websites. Um, there's a lot of organizations out here that is doing the work if you want to get involved. Get involved with one of your KUAs. Um, I'm a big KUA fan. I like the KUAs, what they've been doing with their parent cafes. They have been really doing a great job with it. So get involved with your KUAs. Um, Do you yes. train parents, though? To yes. Yes. Also, if you would like to um, be uh, trained in it, um, also reach out to me on, um, you can reach out to me on Facebook, Sheila Armstrong. You can reach out to me on Instagram, because I know some people, it's Cookie the Goddess on Instagram. Um, you can reach out to me and call me, 267-972-2484. You can reach out th to me through my personal email, Sheila E. Armstrong, 8109 at gmail.com.
because I will train you. The um, I the more people that reach out to me, I do classes. So I usually try to get at least ten people because I like to do parting projects and stuff like that. So once I get ten people, I I have a class from. So if you're interested in being trained as a leader, as an advocate, or just want to learn how to make your voice strong in the community, then reach out to me so we can do the trainings and get you involved. And no age, you can. I was so proud of my Mifflin School family. Okay, this Friday, you can be involved at any age, and that's why I was so proud of them. They brought the cool the school kids out, and they won a new third grade teacher. So that's what we do. We just make sure, and ain't about the whole city. Sometimes it's just about your community. Right there is where the biggest impact is at. So just get involved in your community. You said they want a new third grade teacher. What happened? Yes. So over at Mifflin School, the school district was going to split the classroom up. Okay, and not only split the classroom up, but was going to take away one of the third grade teachers. No, let me excuse me. It wasn't going to split the classroom up. It was going to combine the classrooms. Okay, because um, with the classroom splits, the, neither of the classrooms had more than 20 kids. So they was going to combine and take a teacher away. But the school and the students and the parents love the fact of having small class sizes. Because we know small class sizes work when it comes to teacher instruction. So the children in the classroom that was going to get uh, combined together and the parents and the teachers and the staff came together and formed a protest this past Friday at the school board and they made their short voice heard that they didn't want their teachers on and by the end of their protest they had a meeting with the assistant superintendent and with Miss Evelyn Samples Oates and sure enough they not only did they win that their classroom would not be combined but the teacher would not be taken away and that third grade classroom knew. That's the training that we do. It's just making sure your voice get heard in the community. I'm not coming into your neighborhood to take over. I'm coming to your neighborhood to empower you so you can take over your own neighborhood. All right, because like I said, I live here in North Philly. I got a lot going on down here in this little center. You know, from like I'm working, I said I'm working with the 22nd Police Department because one, I want, I'm pushing to enforce curfew again. Okay, we have too many young kids on these streets at nighttime. It's just like, it's, it's, it's too much for me. There's no reason on a Thursday I'm coming home from work or coming from a community meeting on a Thursday night and I'm seeing 10, 11, 12 year old kids still standing outside playing at 10 o'clock at night. There's no reason. Yeah, I know we got to go get to the root of the home. I understand that, but in order to get to the room, let's get them off the streets first so we can get them inside their homes. And then let's once we get them inside their homes, let's look at the resources of why they're not staying in their homes. So it's like I say, my thinking is like it goes around in circles. is all a cycle with me. So that's why I want just let's just force curfew. Okay, and when, but of course, enforcing curfew is not, and like I tell people, it's not about arresting children or now having them in police streets. What I'm saying is we're going to create a partnership, a, a collaboration that when children are in the streets and the, and the police pick them up, we don't want them to get scared and think they're going to go sit in some jail cell to their parents. Gonna give them. No, we're reaching out to our churches, our mosques, and our synagogues to play a part in this. Okay? Where these are safe havens in our communities. This is what they're supposed to be. Okay? People of faith, I'm a woman of faith. I practice Christianity as my religion. Okay? And I'm going to tell you, you know, people ask me why I'm, I'm not a member of a church because of the fact that, um, unfortunately, I don't like how people play church, okay? I got mad respect for God for what he do with me, and it bugs me. I can't sit in church and I see your kid playing on the tablet, uh, some other game on while your child on tablet, but, you know, it, that bothers me, all right? Because you let your child play on the tablet, at least put on Veggie Tales or some type of religion, Bible, something, you know. But, yeah, you letting them watch cartoons in church. Like, that bothers me, okay? All right, the level of respect that people give or the lack of respect people give God, okay, bothers me. And then, you know, this holier-than-thou, I'm-so-righteous attitude, that bothers me because I am a sinner. You are a sinner. The two. Like, look, get off. Different, different, different issues and concerns.